The ZA Tech Show is made possible by Vodacom. Power to you at vodacom.co.za. And by BlackBerry. Love doing business on your BlackBerry smartphone at blackberry.co.za. Welcome to episode number 177 of the ZA Tech Show. My name is Simon Dingle. It's Monday night if you're watching this live. Time to talk technology once again, as we do every Monday night around this time. And if you're watching the podcast every week for your downloading pleasure. Talking about downloading pleasure, Brett Haggard is here. We downloaded him from uh, Microsoft Build where he was last week. And we've put him in the studio. <coughs> I'm feeling a little bit unzipped still. Thank you, sir. How's it going, Brett? I'm uh, a little jet lagged. Travel safely. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm no incidents. Yeah. No incidents. All of my luggage. Traveling arrived. over 911 and not getting stopped and searched. No stopping and searching, but like pretty, a dodgy uh, pretty horrible. No, no, no. Pretty horrible experience going into the states. So it was really high alert, and they were checking all kinds of stuff and. Uh, Oh, they like that. Half, Keep, the, them busy. half the flights were cancelled, so they were rerouting people. It was it was pretty much standard mayhem. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know that in the in ten years of <laughs> of the TSA being on high alert, they have interrogated individual interrogations are in the billions now, right? Of the people that they've stopped and searched and made take off their shoes. Do you Dude, know? I think that I think that there's like. You know, at least double the amount of people they've made take off their shoes so yeah. far. And all so anyway, like billions and billions and billions. Do you know how many positive identifications have happened in that 10-year period? Zero. Zero, not one. <laughs> it's not working. It's been 10 years. You haven't caught anybody. You're just inconveniencing yes. everybody who travels to your country. Kindly stop yeah, yeah. it now. All you've done is waste people's time and make them eat with plastic knives and forks and take their <laughs> shoes off when they go yes. through the freaking... <laughs> and make them throw away lots of bottles of water. And unless you're in business class, then you get silverware because nobody in business class could possibly be a terrorist. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But no, no, but the silverware is so freaking blunt that you... <laughs> the fact that you're actually sitting closer to the pilot shouldn't uh, have anything Lordy. to do with it. I mean, Definitely. if you're going to do something like that, then you would want to sit in first class because then you could be now riding, riding in like a short distance to walk to the pilot. <laughs> that is the voice of Ben Kelly from the Mail and Guardian and elsewhere. Hello, Simon. How are you doing, Ben? Very well. I'm only a week late, so it's not yeah. too bad. Yeah, you missed the show last week. That was most unfortunate. <laughs> Your lady fans had to be. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Your lady <laughs> to fan. To calm them down. Your lady <laughs> fan had to be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you back, Ben. That's good to have you on the show. It's been a while. I'm glad I didn't got, get banned. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. So this week we'll start by talking about uh, Windows 8. Uh, because Brett has just come back from Microsoft Build. He was actually there with all the developers getting uh, chairs thrown at them and spat on by Steve Ballmer, <laughs> which is what he does when he makes speeches. He throws right things at developers, developers, developers. Yes, developers. yes, he had to actually do it. He did the developers, <laughs> developers, developers. How thing. was Steve this year? Was he on? He was a lot more composed, I'll be honest. But it's strange. You kind of – I was actually saying to a bunch of people there, and you know, the Microsoft people know that I say this a hell of a lot, is he's he's for me – the only embarrassing, slightly uncomfortable part of Microsoft anymore. <laughs> you look at a week of absolutely awesome content from some of the slickest, coolest, rarest, smartest people, yeah. right? That really inspires like an unbelievable level of confidence. And then you have this guy that within like two minutes of walking on the stage, he's got this thing in his voice where he's like, you know, I was asked to come out here today, you know, and he's he, he screams, all right? Yes. It's not louder than what anyone else actually hey, man, sounds. he's excited. He just, he's screaming, right? So within two minutes, you get this stupid tension headache between your eyes. And right. then he talks for another couple of minutes, and it's, there's a bit of sense in it and whatever, but it, he, he looks like this bear <laughs> lumbering across the stage. He looks uncomfortable. <laughs> When he talks, it doesn't inspire any real confidence. Do you know he was voted by his graduating class from, where was he? Harvard, I think it was, as, most, the, as the least likely to succeed in Most life. likely to become a serial I killer. Can, <laughs> dude, I can, I, can, I can completely believe it. I just it. actually just... made that up. No, I'm joking. I don't know if it's true. It's all no, true. If you no, heard it on the ZA Tech Show, it it's true. true. Yes, it is now a fact. It may have not been a fact before, but it is now a fact. It's just, you know what, it, it just 
blew my mind that that he just looks out of place at that company now the company is filled with so many smart red confidence inspiring people that speak from such an awesome level of authority Great. he's running it dude he's, he looks out of place so the bobs the <laughs> the bob <laughs> the buck stops with him awesome. and he's been at the helm of some very good years for microsoft and you know, when people look back at this period and Windows 7 and Windows 8, which would probably be a big success, they're going to say that was Balmer. He did that. Dude, Not that was Joe, the developer downstairs and, in the basement. And that like was Balmer. And like I've said time and time again, I have no problem with that. But I really think they should keep him on the campus at Redmond and let somebody else talk. <laughs> because he just doesn't look like the guy to be doing that right now. Okay, well, he's the CEO. That's my two he cents. To, he has to talk. Anyway, I just finished Anything. writing an article about uh, why Microsoft needs Apple. Uh, and I forgot to mention Balm in there, but I spoke a lot about Bill Gates. Anyway, that's neither here nor yeah. there. Let's talk about Windows 8 because it's looking, it's looking interesting. And I spoke yeah. to somebody this week who's managed to get it running on the Lenovo K1. Well, that's the whole thing, right? It'll, it'll run on pretty much any piece of hardware manufactured in the past two years. Anything that runs Windows 7 should run Windows 8 just fine. Okay, but the K1 doesn't run Windows 7 at all, so a lot of... <laughs> oh, okay, we're talking about the tablet. Sorry, I yeah. blame jet lag. Sorry. That is quite interesting. Um, obviously, it's running ARM, and I saw a couple of tablets at at Build, ARM tablets running uh, running Windows 8. Um, not too much detail on exactly how well they run it. Um, okay. I saw NVIDIA's new quad-core tablet. Um, quad-core ARM architecture. Um, right. They, you know, when I asked them about battery life, they said it is um, somewhere on a par with the tablet side of the market. So I said, great. So somewhere between three and 10 hours is what you're really <laughs> telling me, right? Um, when I asked about performance, all I could say is it's really, really good. It's really, really, really good, man. You won't believe how they, fast they wouldn't let me. Is. They wouldn't let me touch it or hold it or experience Metro on it. <laughs> the F-14 Tomcat, yeah. the fastest plane in its class can i fly it no you may not <laughs> <laughs> but yeah oh, it I was just it was behind this piece of piece of glass so we couldn't actually interact with it but um a lot of the <laughs> so demos they actually yeah, you gotta love that a lot of the demos they had on stage interesting enough were running on the quad core tegra the fastest Indeed. tablet on the market. Can, Can I, I use touch it? it? No. No, you may <laughs> not. No, you may not. <laughs> you may just look at it behind this piece of glass. You may not touch it. It does exist though. It looks so, fast, but we're not going to let you So that's it. quite interesting. Yes, it is running a video right now. What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite interesting that somebody managed to get it running on the K1. Um, As somebody playing with Windows 8 on a Mac, which no doubt will be once again voted the best PC <laughs> for Windows. Yes, I, w I was surprised by how many, how many developers. And I mean, that's a thing with Build. It's for their hardcore, hardcore developers. Five yeah. and a half thousand of their most like dedicated tattoos on their skin of the Microsoft logo. What, you actually saw a Microsoft people. tattoo logo? Yes. Oh, my God. Real ones or like fake ones? No, 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 like real, dude. And some people are like very, very dedicated. But they're also very, very Bring critical me your of head. Microsoft. I would like to smack it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I want to know about this ribbon everywhere on Windows 8 because that looks like fail. Does so the it ribbon, work? So the ribbon everywhere thing... Um, I don't know exactly what they mean by ribbon everywhere. Okay, so let me give you the rundown of Windows 8. So Windows 8. But you actually did use it, thing. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had okay. a tablet. I had one of those Samsung developer tablets for a week that I used. All right. All right. They, um, so you've got this new new interface layer called Metro. Okay. Which looks very, very much like the phone. It's very 2D in nature. There's all of these tiles. All right. right. And the whole idea with tiles, they're moving away from icons to tiles because... Like smartphones, when you look at at um, a screen of tiles, okay. you immediately get information that's embedded inside I'm the app. I'm watching a video of that right now. It looks All quite right. cool. It's running on an iMac. So the idea is you don't have to click on the icon for the weather app in order to get weather information. The weather oh information God. will be on the tile. Your, so your five most recent emails. So basically gadgets. Yes. Okay. Pretty much. But um, <laughs> an architecture that allows every single application to do that. Right. And for you as the user to decide what size you want them to be, mm. where you want them to be, et cetera, et cetera. It's so amazing, that's pretty cool. though, how things move towards sense. It's like we <laughs> used to give you 1280 by 800 pixels to look at pictures of your children or your dog on. And then we realized, hey, we could use all the space for information. 
<laughs> Wouldn't yes, that be novel? Yes. Instead of letting you your mother save all her icons to the desktop, <laughs> and you could look at that overlaid <laughs> on top of a picture of your children, let's yes. put some useful information there, like the weather and, and what your friend you, Steve is having for lunch. And yes. should you want, we can still put the picture of your dog, only smaller, in the bottom left corner. And if you want to save show, a trillion yeah. icons on top of your desktop, we're not stopping you from doing okay. that either. So you've got this layer called Metro. Metro is very 2D. All of these tiles, swap through them really, really easily, reorder them. Um, Social like you know, make cool. make different sizes of them, etc. Mm. Um, they launched ten applications with it. That they actually had a whole bunch of interns write for Metro, um, <laughs> just to illustrate how easy. What it we is. launch with it? I don't know. Get the interns to write something. So, so Social Light is one of the the apps that looks they pretty cool. They I like a lot Social of Twitter Lights. apps. They launched a, lot, a, a ton of photo apps, etc., which was rad. Then. Um, so you have this thing that comes in from the side called the charms, okay, that comes in from the right corner. So what happens is you charms. swipe in, swipe in. Like what you find in your cereal box. Pretty much. Lucky okay. charms, pretty much. <laughs> you swipe in from the right-hand side of, of the screen, and that's the one thing is the system's completely touch-enabled, right? So you swipe from the right-hand side in, okay. and these little charm, charms appear. And, and you essentially have three charms in you that, that are unif universally available. The one is uh, to share. Right, so um, you have the ability to share something from one application out on another form of uh, you know network. You've got your settings. Okay. And I'm trying to think what the third is. It's all very very simple. Sorry, the jet lag starting to kick Pictures in. Pictures like, of properly. Steve. But essentially, the idea Stop is. Stop complaining about jet lag, man up. Okay, so check it out. All right, so the whole thing with, the whole thing with the charms, <laughs> and this is the thing that I actually really like about Windows 8. Right. Yeah. So they've rejigged the entire uh, API infrastructure. Okay. Right, you've got this thing called WinRT, Windows Runtime. Okay, one single runtime. Okay, through which the entire, you know, you know, all of the languages interface with this. They've rejigged the API stack so that you have the ability to write applications that are aware of these what they call contracts. So what would happen is I would develop an application that would be aware of the sharing contract. And Simon, you develop an application that would be aware of the sharing contract. I don't need to build my application to be aware of your application. I just need to build my application to be aware of the sharing contract. Hey man, leave me out of it. So what would happen would be, I'm sitting in my application right now. I swipe in from the right-hand side and I click on share. Right, Every single other application that has been written to the sharing contract will be able to sure, expose its data to my application. Oh, I see what you're saying. All right. Think, I think. I think I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> it's like an API. So, that, so you have these things for called sharing. contracts. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. But not just around sharing. All oh, right. Okay. You can save information. You can send. Sorry, it's like I think it's send, share, settings. There's a couple of different, you know, You know um, what? Charms. I'm thinking this is going to run like a charm on my uh, X201 with a touchscreen. So that, okay, so let me just quickly say, so that whole charms interface and that whole API thing yeah. and, and the way that's been set up is massively compelling because it it shortens the development cycle hugely, all right? I yeah. just have to be able to write to that and say the information that I store as an application can be exposed in the following way using that sharing yeah. contract and I will accept information from the sharing contract in the following ways. So... So I'm in a picture application. I look at a picture. I go share, all right, or I share. Uh, I select five photos. I click on share. It now brings up all of my Twitter applications, all of my Facebook applications, all of the applications that can make use of that data in some way, mean, or form. I click on them, and I send it off, and it goes. Yes. The other thing that's really rad is how they've built the settings interface within Metro. So not only – so you – so you know how on a Mac right now, if you go to preferences, yeah, you get just the preferences re related to the application. Okay. With this, it gives you the, the the settings related to the application, but also the system settings that have context to that application. Right. So from the perspective of a application playing a movie, for example, so you're playing a movie file, and um. You click on settings. You bring the charms up. You go to settings. Yes. It'll give you stuff that controls resolution and how the movie plays and whatever the case is but at the same time there are system settings like color volume etc that would normally sit inside the core control panel yes that those four or five settings are yanked out of it and and displayed in the settings panel at the bottom yeah 
So that's it's just clever little things they've done like that that really smooth the whole thing. Okay, cool. So so that's the good. All right, that's what I really like about it. And All I right. think the interface absolutely rocks. So you've also got this thing, the ability to stack. So there's four different orientations you can have your applications in. So you could, the same way in old Windows, you used to be able to tile three, four, three, four open applications. You can have that now and it's configurable, but they snap to a grid. So they're either a quarter size, they're either half the screen, or they're a panel like a column down the side, or they're three columns. Right. And and inside the the you know um, the applications that allow you to code them, it's um, it's really really simple to define those. Okay. Okay. Cool. So so that's the good. Absolutely love that. Metro is some seriously cool rock and roll. Loving that. All right. Okay. What I'm not loving is the fact that I understand it needs to be there right now, but They've still got the entire Windows desktop as a separate environment, okay? So let me disclaim it with the fact that I understand there needs to be backward compatibility. I totally understand that I want to be able to run applications I was running on XP and Windows 7 and Windows Vista on Windows 8. I can totally understand that. Right. But the reality is they haven't done anything to skin that environment. It looks just like Windows 7. So here you've got this beautiful, very futuristic, 2D, widgety, stunning interface. Yeah. And then the moment you launch Office, it launches in like this normal like Windows view. Yeah. How like else, just parking on yeah, the side. I suppose. Look, it's gonna. You, we're gonna see those user interfaces so, evolve. I suppose it's. Indeed, but I think the thing is Microsoft, and I've said this in a couple of the stories I've written as report backs. I think Microsoft's not putting nearly enough pressure on their developers to move along. They're reassuring them, don't worry, the Windows desktop will always be there because it'll allow for a level of precision input and keyboard sure. and mouse that Metro just doesn't. But it's a big ship that eh? What they really to should no, but what they really should be doing is saying, here's Windows eight. Windows eight will support both. Windows nine won't. Windows nine is going to be Metro and right. just move forward with the times. I suppose it's really difficult for a vendor the size of Microsoft to get that right. Right. But um Hey, I think a ton of other vendors would do exactly the same. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. They are doing a Metro Office version, apparently. Yeah. So apparently Heard they are working on that. it. But I just, you know, the one thing I came away from Build were, you know, with was I just don't think Microsoft's being as convincing. They're not, you know, you know, as what they could be. They should be saying to their, you know. You know, to their devs, and you know, instead of saying there's a, you know, you know, right now the whole thing is there's this great opportunity here, and we should all embrace it, right? They should turn around and say there's this great opportunity here, we should all embrace it. Oh, and you have four years to get your shit onto Metro because after that we're switching the Windows Look, desktop. They're off. probably saying that kind of stuff in the background. Anyway, they have to be careful how they present it to market, mm -hmm. I suppose. For the most part, Windows 8 looking pretty cool. I like the fact that they're pulling the ecosystem together quite nicely with Windows Phone. Uh, Windows 8, Xbox Live, Live yeah. Windows Live. It's not working the way we all wish it would yet, but or and if you're in South Africa, it's not working at all. Ooh, sorry, let, let me quickly just jump in with the one thing that absolutely blew my mind, and this uh -huh. is what I think Microsoft's latent, like sleepy little play here is gonna is gonna be freaking awesome. Is the fact that if you've got a Windows Live ID, you can synchronize everything across everything. What? Okay, so. So, so the Windows Live ID, interestingly enough, not your your corporate identity to your to your um, to your corporate network or whatever, becomes the identity that governs that computer, right? Okay. All of your information automatically synchronizes across every single computer that has um, your Windows Live ID loaded on it. You change your um, your um, log on picture and your desktop background on this machine. Yes. All right. If the other machine is connected to the internet and has your Windows Live ID on it immediately, it changes too. Any preferences you change on any of your machines automatically propagate down to any of the other machines. Yeah. Get this. All right. And it's all using SkyDrive, okay, which is really, really cool. Get this. They're implementing a camera reel that SkyDrive enabled. So you take a photo on your Windows phone, okay. your camera reel that would normally sit on your Windows phone, automatically synchronizes with the cloud. So the and same way that iCloud does with iOS devices and the camera. Okay, well, I didn't know that that, that it does yeah. that. But essentially, your camera reel 
lives in the cloud and every single device until you've pulled stuff out of that camera reel yeah. contributes into that camera reel so every windows device automatically has an online camera reel cool yeah the which I, I thought was that's extremely what Apple's doing with iCloud mm -hmm. and iOS yeah. as well okay so okay that's one thing i wasn't aware of but i thought Very that cool. was extremely rad so all of your data all of your settings um well, everything what... just like synchronizes through through um through SkyDrive, but no. like proper, actually working, doing it, not nice. not like live syncing. Any form of manual intervention. You set it up, you give the stuff your live ID, and the magic just starts happening. But that's the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, that's, that is the way we want it to happen. I mean, right. I mean, but at the moment, if you want that kind of stuff to happen, it requires a good deal of tweaking and yeah. and and finagling to get you know your contacts. For example, we're getting there to, though. To I sync, mean, you know, Google, properly and, and that kind of stuff. Google but does it well for PIM data, mostly yeah. thanks to Microsoft Exchange knocking around in the yeah. back end. Uh, Apple's done it satisfactorily with, with mobile me. It hasn't been great, but I think yeah, iCloud's going to get it right. I still I still look at iCloud and I go, there's still too much manual intervention involved right. here, all right? That was the thing that I absolutely liked about Microsoft's play in this space. It's like everyone's got a Windows Live ID. Whether you use it as your primary ID or not in the it's Windows ecosystem, you. it will be used as the thing that will unlock right. this ability to sync across SkyDrive. And some of the stuff that they showed us was pretty rad, like the ability to, if I want to send you a picture, all right, instead of me attaching that image to... Um, to the email yeah. what I can do is I can bring the charms up using sharing yes. put a link inside you know a SkyDrive link bam into the email and send it to you and when you click it on your side you'll it'll it'll use your bandwidth to go and fetch it out of the cloud and show you the image that's kind of right, right? It. so 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 that's the first thing the second thing that I found unbelievably cool was the fact that um, any machine using the same syncing technology that has a Windows Live ID you can drill down onto its hard drive so he showed us a machine that was sitting at home that he went and he collected photos from. Cool. All right. That was that were not contributed into SkyDrive. They yeah. were sitting on his hard drive at home. Yeah. He showed us program files sitting there. So you know the whole go to my uh, PC thing? You can do, you, you've been able to do this with things like SugarSync for a while. Yeah, but the idea is no extra anything required. Okay. No, I, mean, I just right there in the box. I mean, Every the, machine, you, you know, using Windows 8, and with a Windows Live ID on it, you can access all of your information on right, any any single machine, providing it's got an internet connection. I mean, the thing is that if you're if you're if you're a geek, it's easy to do. Yeah. If you're uh, if you're slightly more technically savvy. If than you're my your mother, grandmother. No, no. I, I use my mother as an example, and I'm saying if you're slightly more technically savvy than my mother, because she wouldn't be able to even get that far. <laughs> <laughs> but she is the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Uh, you know. You then, know then you then then this then this is this is a no-brainer. You I mean you set it all up, and suddenly it starts working. Yeah. And that's what we really want. That, Look, what I want. What's the point? No setup. It's just like typing up username and password. You're done. I don't. I don't yeah. want SkyDrive. I don't want iCloud. I don't want something that's tied that heavily to an ecosystem. I want the services from third parties that will work on anything. So that if I decide next year that I don't want a Mac anymore and I'm moving over to Windows 8, it's a no-brainer, right? Like SugarSync, for example, Mac, PC, Linux, same as Dropbox, Android, BlackBerry, iPhone. You want services that are agnostic and not tied to your hardware vendor, so that when you do chop and change, it's 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 easy yeah. peasy. And Microsoft will tell you SkyDrive works on Mac. <laughs> Too, I promise you it doesn't work as well on the Mac no, as it does on a PC. I totally agree with you there. Can I just counter what you were saying? I totally hear what you're saying because I'm cut from exactly the same cloth. I prefer having a more granular level of control and that third-party play works a lot better for me. The reality, we're not 98% of the computer-using public. 98% of the computer-using public couldn't give a crap about technology and having to set stuff up and having to do all of that control. Yeah. For them, the ability to bomb a Windows Live ID or an or a, or a, or a Apple ID straight mm. into a device and have all of that crap taken care of for them is a serious win. I Say, know, I'm hey. taking your backup away from you. I'm taking this away from you. That it, All you have to remember is this username and password and make sure you use it regularly on an internet know. connection. My, my yeah. mom, who needs help changing channels on DSTV, was able to install Dropbox and get it running herself. Okay. I shared a file with her. She got the email. She clicked, followed the link, set up an account, put in her email address, um, clicked on install Dropbox, and minutes later had the file. Easy to understand. It's a folder on your computer. Anything you do to it happens on my computer as well. Lacquer. Like, I don't think it's that. Did you set that up for her yourself? No, she did. It, she did it all. Okay. All I did was share a file, and she got the email. 
I think it's become easy enough that you don't have to worry about that. And I think when people ask me for advice about cloud services, the right advice is you you need to go with something agnostic. If you're going to cloud backup something, use Carbonite. Don't use something from Microsoft or Apple because you're going to be tied to Microsoft or yeah. Apple to ever get Suppose. your information out of the cloud again. I don't know. Look, what do you think, the, Ben? Well, I think that, I mean, you have the same risks. I mean, like uh, Dropbox decides they're going out of business and suddenly – your, or they're changing their system or, or something happens to them. Yeah, they're and, more likely to go out of business yeah. than Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, with, with Apple and Microsoft and Google, I mean, I mean Google, well, the one thing Google is missing is a really good cloud backup service. Yeah. And I don't understand why they don't have one. True. Uh, I think they think that Google Docs is good enough, but quite frankly, it's not. Because, uh, you know, I like, uh, I don't. I, I like the yeah. idea of Google Docs. I don't use it very much. Do you know there is a way to hack your Gmail storage amount yes. as a drive? No, you yeah. see, I know that very cool. you can do that. It's not official, but yeah, I know you can <laughs> technically do that. But I just don't have the time or the energy to do it. Dropbox yeah. works perfectly well for me, you know. But the point is, is that you know, you. I mean, I don't think Dropbox is going to go out of business. And the, with the way bandwidth is going nowadays, even if they do, they'll give you enough yeah. notice to pull all your stuff back down again and put it back somewhere else. What I uh, battle with is uh, is online backup for things like photos and videos. And yeah. So I'm, you know, I've got all my documents in SugarSync that works really well. I've got some of the handy pictures that I need regularly, you know, scans of ID books and things like that. Um, but what I really would like to do is put my entire photo library, which is massive because, you know, I think most yeah. people carry around massive photo libraries. That, they, that kind of thing. It, we're not at the stage yet where I can happily keep that in Carbonite because it's going to take four years to do the first sync on South exactly, African bandwidth yeah. or thereabouts. Yeah. And the problem is not downstream bandwidth. The problem is upstream bandwidth to get it into the into the cloud. Yeah. Into the cloud with 512K as a maximum upload speed in South Africa. It's just a problem. Use your LTE modem, Simon. That's a solution for you, but not for anyone else. No, it's a solution for five people in South Africa. <laughs> yes, because that that <laughs> thing's that thing's absolutely. But the silly. point is also is that you have these. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how many? I mean, I've got probably 40, 50, 100 gig of photos. Yeah, you know, and I carry around about one hundred and ten gigs of and, photos. And and yeah, how do you? I mean, you have two choices. Either you do a very selective photo album upload. Yeah. So you say, okay, these are the pics I really, really love. And like you would do in in the old days when you're yeah. actually putting together a photo album. But you want to keep all your originals. But the point of digital photography is that you do have this massive yeah. storage Raw of, files of just like stuff I shot over the years. And mm. maybe well, they're not perfect and maybe they're not great. But, the, you know, they're memories. And the only good way to back them up really is on a RAID system as well. Yeah. Because, you you know, burning DVDs, oh man, I give up. It's just filling DVDs and DVDs. And DVDs also are not indestructible. They're better than yeah. hard drives, but, you know. So the only th the only way I feel safe with them backed up anywhere is A, in the cloud service like mm. Carbonite, for example, or B, on a, on a RAID system that's encased in concrete. I don't know. Anyway, I want to talk about LTE. Uh, we want to talk about Gears of War 3 and all sorts of other things that have been happening in tech land. But right now, I want to talk about Vodacom our sponsors of the ZA Tech Show, and we are, of course, very proud and happy to have them on the show. Now, we all know that roaming is a geek's bane, right? When you travel overseas, Brett knows you just come back from the States yep. with your phone and you want to make calls even. It's just too expensive. It's actually ridiculous. And so now with your smartphone checking email uh, and accessing the internet for all of your live services all the time, it's getting crazy. I always say, I mean, imagine if you could go back 20 years and show people what the phones of the future could do. Show them a an modern Android device and go, look at all the things this phone can do, but you can't phone home when you go overseas because it's too expensive or you can't check your email. I think it was ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, sure. it's a bit of a catch-22. We know about this global uh, network of operators charging each other ludicrous uh, sort of prices for, for bandwidth. And it's a, it's a little bit of, a, of a, a sort of a lock that the world is in at the moment. Vodacom, however, has made some strides in making it a bit easier for people and a bit more affordable with their super saver data roaming from Vodacom. And I can talk about this from a customer perspective as well. As somebody who travels all of the time, I've looked for better solutions than this. And short of buying a prepaid SIM in some countries... Um, um, you're not going to get better than the super saver totally. data. Now, the problem is I was in uh, Hong Kong, for example, bought a China mobile SIM. It was cheaper for me to row megabyte by megabyte on Vodacom in China than it was to use a China mobile wow, SIM okay. with prepaid sure. data. Because the problem you have in most countries is that prepaid data is really expensive. <laughs> U.S. as an example. It's like ridiculous. You've got to blow 50 U.S. dollars before you get to a level. Yeah. 
that you're going to be able to cope for a week. I think right. 50 US dollars for 500 meg is yeah. what it works out to now. It's anyway, mad. Vodacom has some really progressive partnerships going for roaming, thanks to them being part of the Vodafone group. If you go into vodacom.co.za, you can select your destination and view the list of partner networks. They now have extended Super Saver data rates to 90 foreign networks across 68 countries, which is pretty rad. Uh, with Super Savers, you automatically qualify for a reduced rate per megabyte. You can control your connectivity costs, get one predictable data rate charge that affects South Africa can rand rates per megabyte so at least you know what you're going to be charged get massive savings with the preferential super saver data roaming rates browse the internet send emails tweet and much more when roaming on selected vodacom or vodafone partner networks now extending to 90 foreign networks as i said how do you get it well data roaming is automatically available to contract customers who have either the vodafone world or vodafone passport roaming options activated data roaming is not available to top up and prepaid customers unfortunately so that's the deal. Check out Vodacom.co.za. I know as a Vodacom customer because I've tested this, you're not going to find better rates for roaming. Still high, but a lot better than anyone else. What at least you know what you're in for. What is the Super Saver rate now, by I the way? I need to go and check. Uh, I remember in China I was paying 17 rand a meg, but I need to, See, I need now to check. See, now that's acceptable when it comes to, you know, for like two days, I was really stuck for connectivity in the States. The hotel yeah. Wi-Fi had gone down. Um, the conference, um, you know, was... Uh, a nice check away so I actually couldn't get there um, and I really needed to send a document that I think was like two megs big tops mm. I would have happily paid that right. I would have happily paid that but again the US is not one of the countries where the yeah. super saver date rates apply so yeah anyway we're happy to have uh, Vodacom as our anchor sponsors of the ZA Tech Show and now regular programming <laughs> T Systems actually has a very good daily rate. I think it was uh, two dollars a day for unlimited data usage on their network on prepaid. That is nice. So too expensive if you live in the states because then it's going to equate to about sixty dollars a month, which but in South Africa visiting, would still be a good price. But yes, but if you're just visiting for four or five days, great. <laughs> Sure. I was in Namibia uh, last week. Namibia Telecom had me speaking at one of the conferences I gave the keynote. And um, it was interesting comparing Namibia's telecoms to South Africa. Um, they pay less for ADSL than we do. For about 720 Rand a month, you can get an uncapped 10 meg line, just un but uncapped. And there's no line rental, ISP, whatever. You get it all from Telecom Namibia. That's cool. Done. Hey? You so see, it's still expensive by world standards, but compared to South Africa, I mean, the point there. is, if Telcom had adopted that model, there wouldn't be it wouldn't be any ISPs in South Africa because everybody would just go with Telcom. Yeah. They had a very affordable looking two meg solution as well that I saw. I hope I'm remembering the prices right. Anyway, I got a Leo SIM card there. You can activate BlackBerry on Leo for a week, which is quite cool and prepaid. It worked out to the equivalent of about seventy five rand, which for a traveling executive is nothing to have their BlackBerry working for a week on yeah. a local network. Yeah. Anyway, I think prepaid is, if you can get a prepaid SIM in a foreign country. It's still the way to go. Although there's so few countries where you can't get it without rigmarole, I've found. America, T-Mobile will give you a SIM with a passport. Uh, Namibia is like, yeah, you just walk into a store. It's funny enough, Germany, it's the emerging countries that will give you prepaid SIMs easily. The Germ developed countries want your Germany is quite interesting, both O2 and, um, and Deutsche Telekom. Yes? T-Mobile. T-Mobile, sorry, T-Mobile and uh, and uh, and O2, oh. really really interesting. You walk in with a passport and you go, um, "Hi, I'd like to get the uh, one month prepaid data <laughs> solution," and they go, "Okay, cool." They go get a SIM card out the back. They load it up. They provision it. Everything else. Nice. They give you the device. They they take down your passport number, um, name, address yeah. of the hotel you're staying at. And there you go. And they like literally say, just use the following as your um, Some kind um, of APN. Uh, so cool. it's only the APN that's different. O2 has the better option. Um, but having said that, um, it works out to more or less the same, except that, okay, so O2s is unlimited for the month mm. for the same cost as getting 3.5 gigs a week. Yes from T-Mobile so I ended up on T-Mobile because of the whole Vodafone connection and everything else and yeah. that worked really really nicely and there was a built in there's actually a built in profile in the R201 that you just select for that package and it provisions it and gets it going and everything else very so cool. very very rad and useful but that um, you know that is something that I'm beginning to recommend so much is someone must take a 3G mobile hotspot with them wherever they go you arrive there, you get a prepaid SIM. It works really, really well. If you're going to do huge data transfer, 
Mm. It's totally a winner, you know. Definitely. Yeah, it's just the whole roaming thing. You know what would be nice is if somebody started a service where you signed up, you connected your TripIt account to it, and every time you added a new trip, it said, would you like a SIM card delivered to your hotel for this country? Yeah, the <laughs> options. <laughs> Pay a flat away. rate. Hey, imagine. There's that service where you can have that done with and a, a MyFi. Hey. Yeah, it's uh, called uh, wi- Club MyFi Club or something like that. Hmm. I can't. Uh, there's actually been a pick on the ZA Tech Show before, Nicholas Caligari. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's very limited. I think it only worked in the UK and USA when I tried it. Yeah. They send you a MyFi device to your to your hotel. You kind of charge it up, chuck it in your backpack, connect your phone to it or whatever, your computer, your tablet, and then you have a MiFi while you're roaming. It wasn't cheap, but it was way cheaper than roaming data. Yeah. And I mean, I, yeah, I think it's still the, the roaming portion of the, of the um, yeah. sorry, the data portion of the roaming, uh, you know, environment that's, that, yeah. you know, that's ridiculous. I have not come up with an alternative voice solution, mainly because it's just actually too much hassle. Mm. It is way easier just having all Skype of my calls di- No, 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 mm. having all of my calls diverted to voicemail and phoning using GSM, phoning home using GSM. Unless, of course, you happen to have a really nice, you know, internet connection, in which case Viber works fantastically well. Skype works really, really well. I use FaceTime. I've, I don't know what that, what that we codec used, just works so what well. What we used in, in Germany, which was quite smart, is we ended up using a product on the, a, a little um, app on the iPhone called Haytel. And the cool thing with Haytel is it's like a walkie-talkie, but an IP walkie-talkie. Yeah. So, so there wasn't sustained enough bandwidth to do um, Skype calls a lot of the time for you know for all of us that were cruising around Germany or do Viber calls yeah. even though we were all on connectivity all the time right so so with Haytel the nice thing is you just you know press a button on the screen you talk a little message into it so like hey dude we're ready to leave for the venue now why don't you come down to reception you let go of it it packages it up in a little like you know mp3 file and ships it off to the other app right which in turn plays it and then that dude gets like a so weird. you know a little response to that but the nice thing is because it's like transferring it as a little file from back you know from from like one machine to the other you're not worried about latency you're not worried about sustained bandwidth or anything That's like pretty that pretty cool hatel.com Haytel is the business. Available it's for Android us. and iOS, no BlackBerry. It saved us when we were traveling. In and it's free. Yeah. Nice, very really cool. Like that. All right. I'll Wasn't going to be a pick of the week, I'm but <laughs> traveling. Um, anywho. I'm sure there will be good picks of the week. So uh, what else should we talk about? We're heading into Christmas game release season. Yes. Deuce X was the first big one. Gears of War 3 is out on the 20th. So by the time you no, have the this launch podcast, it'll probably be available. The no. launch event's tonight, happening yes, while yes, we're sitting right. here. Yeah, indeed. But that's okay, because I've been playing it since Thursday. <laughs> now, my copy arrived at the office. I was in the States. And the you boys wasn't have appropriated it. <laughs> sure and promised have. to give it back to me by Wednesday, so I can get a look at it. But this it's This all about it's multiplayer, hey? I'm tempted. I don't want to give Microsoft money for a South African Xbox Live account, because I'm protesting against how useless it is. But I'm tempted to fire it up again just to play this multiplayer. Gears of War 3 has always been one of the best multiplayer console experiences, uh, or Gears of War in general, obviously. Well, the nice thing, I mean... this looks amazing! The co-op element is just so fantastic. Remember, you and I played through a good deal of Gears of War 1 together. It was rad. You feel like a complete couch potato, though, (laughs) because you're like parking on the couch with a controller and the headset on. Yeah. Talking about your day at the <laughs> office and discussing business and or whatever monsters. the case. And shooting stuff in the head, right? That's awesome. <laughs> it's like fantastic. The, the, quality, of computer gaming? the quality of the call of the of the voice is just absolutely fantastic. Microsoft has I I will go out on a limb and say that, that Microsoft has the best sort of uh, multiplayer gaming technology built into the Xbox. I don't know how they do it, but I at one stage was playing on a hundred and ninety two kilobit per second connection and I we I had voice going and it it wasn't sort of a slow moving strategy game it was a fast paced fps you got the voice going you got the game going it's really smart technology it doesn't use a lot of bandwidth and it's a great experience i uh, i love multiplayer on the xbox unparalleled so there you go gears of war 3 you know what amazes me about it is you look at the graphics quality and what they're able to do compared to the first gears of war on the same platform and you realize what happens when you you keep developers on a basic set of hardware and you force them to 
to, to work with it. Yes. I mean, remember the the PlayStation. The first PlayStation one, uh, PlayStation One games were like a notch above the old sixteen bit console systems. They were they were better. But nothing compared to what they were eight years later after that thing being on the market with its like two meg of RAM and yeah. and it's all about what I mean. I think it's a lot about how you can how you can render stuff, pre-render stuff. Yeah. I mean, the it's 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 not just about how much power you have in the hardware. It's how much power you have in the machines you are using to build the game. Yeah. And and if those if when those, as those machines improve and as the rendering software improves yeah the, you you're starting to say okay well actually I, I don't have to do abc i can do xyz yeah, you know yeah. and that makes a huge difference i think to to yeah. to the quality of games but it's i mean i think people are just right but uh, i mean you look at gears of war 1 and you look at gears of war 3 and you cannot believe they're running on the same hardware it's just unbelievable so i mean good. the question really is is at what point do we t- are the the hard are the Sony's and the Microsoft the world's going to say well actually now we think we're hitting the <laughs> hitting the limit and we and we think we need to bring in a new ver- a new set of hardware I mean there yeah. was talk the Xbox uh, 360 is pretty old now it's what yeah. 2004 hey yeah so six yeah. seven we're years old at, yeah. no but we're looking at I think at least two years before there's any new well there's not even next generation consoles I mean, making their way to the market right? there's yeah. there's been some like Xbox 720. <laughs> no, there's, been, there's been rumors of well, the new Wii's been rumors coming. Of, of of yeah. I mean, the Wii's, but they, they that's kind of they they were always on the lowest common denominator. Yeah. In terms of hardware, so I don't think that's really going anywhere. Uh, I mean, it's not really a comparison in terms of. I mean, even the new one's not going to be. It's going to be as good as a PS3 or an Xbox in terms of display quality. Yeah, yeah. And when when the next generation of the high end machines come out, then we're going to see some serious kick ass hardware. You know, Sony has to be working on something well, they, unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, because uh, they've lost yeah. f- ground in this market. Well, Sony's stuck between a rock and a hard place yeah. because last time they came to market with cutting edge hardware. Yes, like the best. Most awesomest yeah, like six blue core. Blu-ray cell processor, and they really, I mean, they 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 bought. They said, you know, let's let's make a, a console with the best hardware we can possibly lay our hands on. Yeah, you know, and what happened? Microsoft came to market with what is essentially commodity hardware. Yeah, and Microsoft kicked their ass. Right, you know. Right, and so what does that tell you? It tells you that that you. That it's more important to bring something to market which is maybe not as cutting edge, yes. but which is which is uh, cost effective. Yeah, then it's it, all about the exclusive content, um, yeah. the games that come out first. Although Sony's winning that war at the moment, there's more exclusive content coming out at the moment for the PS uh, than than for the Xbox. But Microsoft's worked the formula out. I remember, remember when Bill Gates got up when they first announced the Xbox and said we're going to own this market, and everybody laughed at him. They're getting there. I've done quite a I good think job. Connect was a was a significant milestone as well. Yeah. That pushed them into a new segment the of the market three, that wasn't out dreaming of Out of the three motion Xbox gaming before. solutions out there, and I've got all three of them, I must say I far prefer my Connect. And my kids warm to it so I mean they, you know, that it's so much easier for them to make use of Connect than what it is for them to play with a Wii or the PS move. Seriously. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it is just so much rarer. It's it looks better in your in your um Lounge, yeah. your lounge. Um, it's, I just it's have to move my coffee table out the way every time the kids want to play. I mean, Kerry's <laughs> jawing Zumba on it, and the I'm really, really loving it. Yeah, it's it's cool, dude. The the PlayStation system uh, is pretty amazing in its accuracy. Oh, sure, mm. uh, sure, sure, sure. But you're still holding a pink lollipop. You're still yes, holding a p- well. You could hold a green yes. or a blue lollipop yeah. if you wanted to. Yes. Ben. You're still going to look like you a can't tool choose the color of your holding lollipop. a lollipop. <laughs> but you're <laughs> An still electronic glowing lollipop. Yes, you still look like a uh, one of those guys who guides the airplanes. Yeah. I'm sure they have names for what they do. Don't know what it is. <laughs> But they no, are the guys there. that work in the complaints department. <laughs> <laughs> complaints, funny. complaints. So, anywho, LTE. Yes, let's talk about it. Well, I mean, it's going to be one of my picks to of the say. week. But anyway. you can't pick something that's not available, Brett. But you can. I totally can. Okay. It's something that I'm super. Dude, Shapshak picked Aki Anastasio one week. He picked <laughs> paper another week. Yeah. All right. He's I picked can, lunch once. <laughs> I can pick LTE <laughs> as a technology. All right, so let's let's get okay, some well context here. Hold on, let's get some context here because MTN made the announcement a few weeks ago that they are piloting LTE in Gauteng. Um, it's a big deal, but I mean, you know, so is Vodacom. They've got a few live LTE towers. Uh, they're not being as forthcoming to journalists with that LTE as, as MTN has been because they've selected a few of us to try out the LTE network, which uh, is pretty bold. Yes. Um, I haven't managed to get mine to work. 
I've got the modem. I, I suspect there's no coverage in my area because I'm not connecting. I've tried it at two You'd spots be surprised in Joburg. There's actually, there's actually more coverage. Well, I well look. I expect it. There's no coverage in my area. There Although, can't be because I'm not. And remember, connected. it also does cruise down levels, so it'll it'll throw you down to HSUPA if that's all you've got. It's just not ca- mate, okay. I need to look into we ha- mine. It's we, not we, working. We have two at the office, and the one's doing exactly that, where you don't get. It just won't connect. Yeah, there's no bars read out, nothing, right? Yeah, mine just won't connect. Okay, yeah. So so phone them. I, th- I think it's a SIM card that's gone screwed. Anyway, I mean, my, my thing with LTE is fantastic technology. If the core of your network can't support it, it doesn't matter. And whether it's LTE or HSUPA or even just normal 3G, a crap network's not going to, to give you anything significant in terms of bandwidth. Yes, you can have a very fast connection to your tower, um, but what happens from the tower to the rest of the internet is what you really care about, right? Sure. Contention so LTE me, handles it a bit better. Delete some stuff off my hard drive because I'm officially about running to out of run space. out of drive space. Downloading stuff via LTE. Okay, yeah. So what so, kind of speeds are you getting testing right. MTN's LTE network? So right network? now, sitting here, I'm getting 30 megabits per second. Okay. I'm pulling NZBs down. All of these images of these Linux distros that I desperately wanted to get my hands on using news groups because it's right. the most uncontended, clean way for me to get it. Right now, it's fluctuating anywhere between 2.5 and 2.9 megabytes per second. All right. right. Which equates to roughly 10 gig of data downloaded since we started recording the ZA Tech show today. Right. So how many minutes are we in? 45 minutes, 10 gig (laughs) yanked down over a wireless connection. It's impressive, but you could, you could do similar things on an uncontended HSPA plus network, you know? Where you're going to find the uncontended portion is the first part. Brett, you're testing an LTE network no, that no, no, has no, no. five other people on it. Yes, but I'm also testing an LTE network that, that has a theoretical cap, oh, sorry, a maximum of 70 megabits per second. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. But that ceases to, like, for example, so theoretically, the on Vo- hold on, on Vodacom's HSPA Plus network, you should be able to get up to 43 megabits per second. With as many people connecting as there are, you will never see that speed. So 70 megabits per second is cool. It's roughly twice that. I would argue that if if this were if this were available publicly, if there were thousands of people using it, you would never see more than tops 10 megabits per second on it which is great it's one megabyte it is great, per second Steve, but my point I mean, is that stuff. is that you you could do similar stuff on hspa plus for me the more important Look, talking the points are price and coverage right where is it available and how much does it cost so the important things for me is okay so coverage is going to be a factor of where they decide to put towers right and when hspa becomes old yes. it's going to get replaced with lte yeah. Right. That's the first thing. The second thing is price. I think is a factor of of uh, you know e- economies of scale once again. Get yeah. enough devices into the market. Get enough users into the market. Naturally migrate your HSPA users to LTE. Right. And price is not going to be Look, an equation. From what I've I've gathered so far, and a couple of people I've spoken to, LTE isn't alarmingly more expensive than what HSPA is. But the it's not alarmingly reason, faster either. Well, it's got more headroom. Yeah, yeah. 70 megabits is by no means the top end of the scale. This thing goes a hell of a lot beyond that, firstly. It, it, which exceeds the core of the network. So, and when, I mean, we've seen a one gigabit HSDPA, per second LTE and when, connection working. And when, when HSDPA debuted, it debuted at 3.6 megabits, right? That was before people really started tweaking and toggling with it. Back then, when it was 3.6 megabits, Nobody thought it was going to get to the point of being at 43 megabits. The bit that excites me right now is this is a technology that right now in its first incarnation is pushing 70 megabits per second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? That means, all things being equal, by the time it's done doing its natural progression, you're looking at a technology that's pushing 200 megabits per second, and by the time they stop screwing with it like they they did with HSPA to get it to 43 meg, right? we're looking at close to a gigabit Brett you're not listening That's to rare. me because I'm not dissing LTE it's cool technology but it's not available it, you can't have it it doesn't matter how oh, much no, no, money you sure. have you can't, you can't have, have it right it. now but in the next and two years 
people it's will have. It will be two years before anybody can buy it commercially. Sure. Okay, so it's fun for those of us who are playing around with it at the moment. But the realities of something that's brought to market, that's available to millions of people, is very different. HSPA Plus, okay, they're already pushing 160 megabits per second through it in some countries. Yeah, Australia okay, is one test. of those countries. Telstra, now, I think LTE, is you're right. The ceiling's higher for LTE. I've personally watched a one gigabit per second LTE connection happen in lab conditions with Ericsson at Mobile World Congress last year. Okay, it's possible. But there are network realisms that keep you away from seeing anywhere but a fraction of that speed. So to me, I'm not excited by it. I'm not excited by it because at the moment we have towers no. available in South Africa, commercially available, that do 43 megabits per second. And I'm lucky if I get 3 meg out of them. Okay? Mm -hmm. And oh, that's the reality. <laughs> because when you factor in contention and cell shrinkage and all of the realities around cellular, it stops looking as cool as it is for those of us playing around with the LTE stick at the moment. Oh. Well, I just uh, think look, I can't it agree is plenty look, cool okay, for you know us. Yeah. You're right, you're right. I'm not a fan of progress either. I think it sucks. Uh, progress. <laughs> he's a baby. <laughs> he's a child. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, the I point hear what you're saying, but I'm picking it because it is freaking cool. And for you, I get excited about new technology. Sorry. <laughs> I'm that guy. I'm that sad guy that gets excited oh, no, about none the of, fact. Yeah, the, the rest of us don't get excited no. about new technology, hey Ben. No. no, no, no. No, I'm not fondling my iPad. No, we weren't. We weren't so excited by Windows 8 at the beginning of the show. No. But I mean, I think I think the point <laughs> it's is it's incremental, Brett. It looks big on yeah, paper, sure. but it's incremental. I think, no, 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 sure. I think what we, I mean, and I'm going to agree with my wireless things. didn't hey. suck until <laughs> everyone else got on yeah. it. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the issue here is very simple: is is that when we, they launched 3G. We were stuck on if you're we lucky you had edge and there were basically there was no mobile data mobile yeah. data was a joke i mean that, that's the reality of it right. they launched what what th what 20 it was like 56k 56 I mean, kilobits yeah. per second i mean basically you got i mean i think it could go up to 384k but i mean in reality you're getting done no 384k was where 3g weighed in yeah that was 3g true, yeah 384 okay. kilobits per okay. second and and it, so it was nice wow it those was, were the days it was nice it was nice because i mean if you got a, if you got a decent speed out of it, it was about the same speed as your entry-level telecom adsl line but you never got that kind of speed but i mean it was like and i remember because we were like going oh my god this is going, this is going to be so awesome when 3g came <laughs> i could have uh, my email anywhere yes. <laughs> i mean it was it was the possibilities that yeah. that excited us like what could we do with a decent high speed mobile internet connection yeah and with things like the ipad and the uh, and android and all and smartphones we're starting we're seeing the answer to that question is what can i do with a decent high speed mobile yeah. connection and we will uh, get to one gigabit and, per second wireless connection and, one day we have to and That's progress uh, so so the point is that that it the speed of your network is irrelevant what re network you're using is irrelevant we are now today we are at a point where you where you can do pretty much anything you want to do on a decent mobile connection. Yeah. You know, I do preface that with the word decent because if it's too contented or if your signal sucks or if you happen to be living behind that one hill in your suburb where no cell phone network uh, actually reaches uh, and the only way you can make and receive a phone call is by standing on your roof <laughs> holding <laughs> onto, your, onto your, your bunny ears, Ariel. In uh, an electric storm. In an electric storm. <laughs> then, then, yeah, I mean, there are, so, but I mean, I, I mean, I'm at home. I'm using an ATA uh, SIM. I'm getting one bar of coverage and I'm getting like well over a megabit of, of thing. That's because the network isn't really heavily con congested at the moment. Yeah. So I can, I can get away with that. If the network becomes really heavily congested, uh, hopefully by that point they will have improved the coverage in my area. So I'll, I'll have three or four bars of coverage. Yes, but, we'd like but to the, believe. We would like to believe. But the point is, is that it's not the amount of coverage or the speed of the network which matters is what you can do with it. Yes. You know, if I can stream if we if we had like a decent stream if we had like nice big bandwidth caps and and good streaming stuff and we could stream like you can with hulu and netflix yes uh across the network that would be the most awesome thing in the world i mean i wouldn't care whether i was using the lte network or whether i was using 3g or hspa or, or you know right or the dog's breakfast you know it would be <laughs> it would, as long as i can watch my movie Wherever at the moment I'm like yeah. I'm using AirPlay uh, to watch. Uh, I've got all my movies sitting on my computer, and I sit there with my iPad and I lie on the couch and I watch TV. Yes, you know, which is awesome, you know. But that's but that's just like it's 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 not. I mean, I would prefer to do that over a 3G network actually. 
yeah. because then I wouldn't have to worry about. Oh, uh, have I got my Wi-Fi on? Is my laptop on? Is it has it? So you know? I, I mean, looking at it, do you really think that terrestrial communications in the next two years? Okay, so assuming this launches in the next two years, yes, right, with this kind of level of performance, yeah, considering that that HSPA networks in South Africa are already, from a client perspective, if you're talking about consumer computing, yeah, eclipsing terrestrial networks to be honest i don't care because i'm hoping that before lte comes to market in south africa i'm going to get curb fiber from photocom or neotel or whoever okay but and the that's, point that's, I'm, that's no, no, quite the realistic point I'm hey? make, you, no, symmetrical no, sure. 100 already, megabit per second at least connections there's there's a fiber trench as wide as this table mm. down my street dude I'm, I'm in exactly oh, the same boat as you. To I, me, wireless is, is your backup, is your mobile solution, is your I'm not at home and I'm not at the office, or what am I going to do? Uh, luckily, I've got this thing in my pocket. Like that for me is, is what it's for. Sure. It should never be your primary connection. And I'm hoping that before we see LTE come to market, we have a competent fiber to the home provider. I mean, what ben, ben, do you see that happening in the next three years? Vodacom's got the Metro Ethernet rings. MTN's got the fiber. Neotel's got the fiber. They're just focusing I on corporate. I think somebody needs to have a business model. And I think that business model isn't going to be driven by the companies themselves. It's going to be driven by individual groups of, of consumers. Yeah. A street, a suburb, a little enclave, a little gated community, a little... No. You know, we're already seeing this kind of stuff in the gated communities where yeah. where it's all fibered in already. Yeah. I mean, they probably... They, the, the only problem there is that they get ripped another arsehole and by, no, the, by the service there's providers. There's no backhaul, yeah. Now, there's no backhaul that's capable of... There are also of companies that are still thinking about DSL, right? So I met somebody from Alcatel Lucent two weeks ago who showed me two pieces of amazing technology. The one was a cellular base station that fits in your hand. It's called the light radio. It's literally that big. It replaces current cellular base stations, uses a fraction of the I electricity, yeah. has the same coverage. What kind they of capability put the does it push? Is it mainly voice or is it... No, no, this is LTE. It's LTE capable and it's this big, okay? To replace a base station that's like knocking about on a fake tree in Johannesburg. <laughs> so that was cool. But the other thing he showed me was um, new DSL technology that Alcatel Lucent has developed in their labs that pushes your DSL limits beyond 125 megabits per second, okay? And I said to him, but the copper in South Africa is in a terrible shape. He says, okay, so maybe 80 megabits per second, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, and now I saw, a, I watched uh, TED videos. Uh, yeah. And there's a guy, they're basically taking LED light bulbs and they're using the light. Essentially what they're doing is they're transmitting data through LED light bulbs by flickering the light bulbs. Mm. And you can stream data down up t uh, to your computer. It's quite old school. Yeah, yeah. but it's, but it's, there's no, the, the point they're making is that because it's using light, there's no frequency contention. Uh -huh. I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can use, uh, big, and because it's, I mean, I'm not sure how they get the data back up again. I can yeah. see how you get the data down. But, yeah. but, but just the, the thing is that the people are coming up with really, really awesome ideas. Exactly. Now, if Telcom could give me a reliable 25 megabits per second at home, I'm a happy, happy camper. If the price is right, right. Dude, hey, I take 10 meg at the moment, so I'm still <laughs> sitting on four. Dude, I dude. would take four because my line can't do more than two because my copper's in such a shape. mental. So, you know what? I kind of went, oh, 10 meg in our area. Please, please tell me it's true. Sure, no problem. We'll put you on 10 meg, which immediately <laughs> synced to five meg, and I think I was getting five bits through that right. line. It, was just, it just went absolutely mental. Throttled it back to four meg, and now conveniently the line doesn't drop every 20 seconds see i had the same thing now. mine would drop all day oh. with four and now i'm on two stable stable anyway we need to do our picks of the week but before we do i want to talk about blackberry our other sponsors of the za tech show of course they've just launched the 9900 in south africa that's the new blackberry bold it's got an nfc chip inside it nfc is quite exciting technology um, yeah, and there's amazing things you could do with it. Working yeah. at Build, actually. And it was and very I, cool. I spoke to the organizers of Opikopi. I ran into them at the airport yeah. last week. And they said that NFC, depending who you spoke to, was a massive success at Opikopi. And they can't wait to be able to do it with phones as well. So lots of interesting opportunities yeah. for train stations, um, for paying for things. Uh, and of access course, to buildings. That's what I want. Yeah. I want I, I'm access around, cards. I'm carrying around two access cards. One for my car, the parking lot, and one for the building. Yeah. It's like, you know, why can't I just wave my phone at these things? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it would totally make sense. So now BlackBerry's uh, 
partnering with uh, HID Global's, um, well, this is the company that's doing their iClass digital keys and readers. Uh, HID Global is the trusted leader in solutions for the delivery of secure identity, announced an industry first with plans to support the company's iClass digital keys and mobile secure identity on NFC-enabled BlackBerry smartphones. So BlackBerry users will get that kind of access before anybody else will, Ben, it seems. Uh, the new BlackBerry Bold 9900 or the 9930, which is the CDMA version, and then there's the Curve 9350 or 60 smartphones are activated with the iClass digital credentials and they'll be compatible with the large installed base of iClass readers that are used for applications ranging from physical access systems in buildings to student IDs to applications that track time and attendance. So that'll all be making its way to BlackBerry users shortly. Of course, the uh, new Bold is out. It's available in South Africa, as I said. It runs the BlackBerry 7 operating system. Um, and, and it's uh, awesome. Yeah, thinnest I mean, BlackBerry smartphone one, yet. That's and, one which has uh, the touch screen browser and, the, as well. and the keyboard. And the yeah. keyboard. I mean, I think that's just like the answer to a lot of people's uh, yeah. prayers. Yeah, people who don't like touchscreen keyboards. Yeah. People not like me. It's anyway, we're very happy to have BlackBerry really on does, the ZA yeah. Tech Show. Check out BlackBerry.co. Yeah. Yeah. We love them yeah. so much. I know Simon's <laughs> ending up in this little, the promo part of it, but I mean, I have to say that, I mean, a lot of people ask me what, what phones to get. And it's kind of, I mean, one of the answer questions is as soon as you say, do you want a touchscreen or do you want a keyboard? And anybody says, well, I want a keyboard. You say, I get a BlackBerry. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and everybody who I've recommended that they get a BlackBerry, I mean, this is not even the latest one. I mean, mm -hmm. the latest one is just like 10 times more awesome as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's got a really comfy they, keyboard. They, they, they come back to me and they say, it's the best phone I've ever had. Yeah. Really? Look, I always say to people that it depends on you. If you want to save money, BlackBerry is the way to go. The value proposition is definitely better than Android or iPhone just because you're going to use so much more data on those platforms. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as you said, is the keyboard. And I said, I always say to people, if you're big on messaging, instant messaging, Twitter, you know, that sort of thing, the BlackBerry does lend itself to that nicely with unified inboxes yeah. and stuff. The fact is, however, that, you know, for everything else, especially if you're looking for a wealth of apps, you're going to be happy on an Android device yeah. or an iPhone. But uh, the BlackBerry still got its niche for sure. All right, let's do our picks of the week. Let's start with cool. Brett. Well, you kind of done yours already. So eh? I did pick LTE. I'm going to pick another pick that I picked before. Because Is it I a USB turntable? No, 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 no. And I know I've picked this before. But um, I chatted a couple of weeks ago about a um, about a joystick for the iPad called the Fling. Yes. Yeah. Right. These two little suckers that you attach to your iPad. It's yes. on this like perspex spring, and it uses this uh, conductive. Uh, you know, my birthday's material. coming up soon. <laughs> so um, so I managed to get one while I was in the States. Right. 30 bucks for a two-joystick uh, two kit, or yes. 20, 20 bucks. When I say bucks, I mean dollars, of course, Yeah. for the uh, one-joystick kit. It is freaking awesome. Okay. Changes your iPad gaming experience. So what's really, it really called again? It. It's called the Fling Joystick for iPad. It's made by... And it's not the same one that you picked a few weeks ago. It is, it is the same one. It is the same one. So you're picking it again. I am, because okay. I've now actually played with it. <laughs> but if Ben could pick the turntable three times, I could yeah. pick that. <laughs> and, it, and, and it sucked. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, absolutely awesome. Made by 10-1 Design, the same guys that make the Pogo. Yeah. So, um, yeah, having a ton of fun with that. Really, really rad. Um, Very cool. And worth and worth the cash. Okay, 10one-design.com written out. Yes. And the uh, link Forward to the fling, fling is over PHP. there. They've got some games that they feature with it, like Robokill. Well, actually, Robokill's the only one. Okay, very cool. But uh, a lot of the 3D games, anything that uses a digital D-pad, yeah. it's uh, not a, it does, it doesn't, it and it works quite nicely. Doesn't it suck, excuse the pun, putting the thing on and off all the time? No. Not it's, really, simple, no, it's simple. Really, really you pop it off. Awesome. It comes, a little, comes with a little silk bag. Make that sound effect. That you can pop. <laughs> you pop uh, cool. Uh, that you pop them in to keep them keep them nice and safe and clean. Um, and yeah, of course, the other rare thing is you don't end up with like tons of finger smears. Right. On your iPad. Nice. I, I like it. Great. So anyway, Ben yeah. Kelly. I'm going to do a half pick first on behalf of my son, a pick. who has been playing Need for Speed Hot Pursuit. Yeah. And and he gets back. He comes to my house every now and like sort of once a, once a week twice a week okay. and uh, the first thing he says is can I play the racing game <laughs> and what's go, he playing it on uh, on the iPad yeah very and, cool and he goes and it's so very I, good on the on the playbook as well so I go so I go when you've done your homework and he goes <laughs> finishes his homework he goes can I play the racing game and I go when you've had supper <laughs> he says can I play the racing game and I go when you've had a bath 
It's a big challenge. It's like it's like the ultimate bribe yes. to get no, into the No, we do Doom exactly and... the same with our kids. Just not but, the racing game. But uh, not as technically sophisticated. But I find infinitely more fun is a game called Jetpack Joyride. Okay. It's a straight platform. There's there's uh, you basically there's a mild mannered accountant who <laughs> like Les Manley. <laughs> yeah, who who wanders past the lab and sees a jetpack in there, breaks through the wall and steals a jetpack and has to negotiate nice. zappers and as missiles. As happens, you know, and, as happens. Uh, and stuff like that. In corporate environments. That and then you get like little missions to do. So you have to like have <laughs> like ten near misses with a missile or, you know, go so far in this vehicle or that vehicle. All the vehicles are a little bit odd and crazy, you know, like there's one called uh, Mr. Cuddles, which is like a Chinese dragon, and what? Uh, Cuddles. <laughs> and uh, but and but what happens is you obviously accumulate money and you collect coins through this thing. And once you've completed all the missions, it says to you, "Do you want ah, to?" That's from the creators of Fruit Ninja. Nice. Do you want to? Cr do you want to sort of cash in your thing and start at the beginning again? Yeah. And because you haven't bought all the jetpacks yet and all the vehicles yet. Yeah. So, so it keeps you playing over and over again. I'm on now on my third time round, and I'm still not bored of it. So, <laughs> I can thoroughly recommend it. There's a fantastic intro video we're busy watching. Very cool. All right, nice jetpack joyride. I will go and buy it, and then I will play it. Yeah, you can also do if you if you want to cheat, you can buy coins in the from with, with real money uh, okay. to buy all that stuff but i think total cheating yeah i think that's <laughs> you know it's part of their business model but i still think uh, it's cheating cool i'm gonna go and check it out all right that looks amazing i am picking a piece of open source software that has uh, been very interesting for me over the weekend uh, i can't tell you who we're talking about because they've asked me to protect their identity for now because there's a police operation underway uh, to retrieve a stolen laptop that's running the software. So the software oh, is called yes, Prey. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll find the website for you in a moment. Um, no, Google it. Preyproject.com. Preyproject.com. There you go. I've installed it on all of my computers now. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. What happened was uh, this person's laptop was stolen out of their boot. Their signal from their car remote was jammed. Um, apparently this is happening a lot in South Africa at the moment. Guys will use a garage remote or uh, you know just about any remote. And if you're close enough to a car and you hold it in while somebody's trying to lock it, the car doesn't lock, which is why, well, it was, isn't why, but fortunately I'm one of those pedantic souls who always make sure my car's locked before I walk away. I look for the lights flashing. And the, yeah, I listen for the sound the as click, well yeah. for the sound of the lock. So. Anyway, if you're in a hurry, you might miss it. Uh, and sure. so his laptop was stolen. He activated Prey and within hours started receiving pictures of somebody using his laptop, uh, started receiving lists of the software they were installing and the geolocation. It uses yes. Wi-Fi databases um, combined with all sorts of other technology to actually bring up Google Maps and show you where your laptop is combined with pictures of whoever's using it. It activates the webcam without turning on the light. Uh, on the Mac, so they don't know their pictures are being taken of them. Wow! And he sent me an email of the um, of the report that it compiled. It's quite scary seeing this, you know what, using his computer. Anyway, uh, PreyProject.com, as Ben said, I've installed it on all my computers. It's free, um, but it has some powerful features available if you upgrade to Prey Pro, which I'm actually doing now because I've installed it on so many computers I think I should be contributing how much does the pro version cost <sighs> start at five dollars a month there for the personal one which is up to three devices yeah and uh, it goes up to four hundred dollars yeah. a month and that's for five hundred devices doesn't just cover your computers though you can use yeah you can do phones as well your phones, yeah. well Android, uh, Android it doesn't install on iOS but oh, okay. you can do it on Android yeah alright probably but very because cool. it conflicts with the uh, find back find my, yeah. find my phone or now, this thing is a tiny footprint. You don't notice it running in the background. It doesn't do anything until you activate it via the web control panel, and then it starts sending reports and collecting data. Now, these guys had hacked the admin account on the laptop. They changed the admin password. They created new user accounts, um, and it was still working, still gathering information about them. So check it That's out. Right. That's so my he, pick of the week. Is he drawing close to catching the... Yeah, well, over the weekend, apparently, they were there. I just couldn't get hold of him today to find out if I could please mention who he is and tell the story. So, all right, we'll keep it uh, keep it closed for now. Indeed. All right, it's time to end off the show. Fun one this week. Thanks for being here, Ben Kelly. Always a pleasure, Simon. Ungeeked.co.za or at Benedict Kelly on Twitter yeah. is where you'll find him. 
at Benedict Kelly on Twitter is the best place. There you go. <laughs> Still haven't updated that blog. Have I you? did once. I did. <laughs> I haven't updated my uh, blog. For I might ages. do one this week. <laughs> uh, Brett Haggard from Hypertext Media Communications, bretthaggard.com or at Brettsky with two T's and SKI on Twitter. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, sir. Yeah, it was fun. And I am at Simon Dingle. This was episode number 177 of the ZA Tech Show for Monday night, 19 September 2011. The ZA Tech Show is made possible by Vodacom. Power to you at vodacom.co.za and by BlackBerry. Love doing business on your BlackBerry smartphone at blackberry.co.za. We'll be back next week. Thanks for watching, listening, whether you did live or post the fact. Good to have you. Check out our website, zatech.co.za. Cheers. And that's it.